The infamous skimwalkers terrify all in their wake, and are a very real danger if encountered. It's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. This started when my two brothers, David and Luke, and Luke's girlfriend Sarah, all drove down to the desert to spend some time in the country. This is reservation land as it were, so red dirt everywhere. We had some pistols, and decided to go target practice. We took our gear and some old targets to this place called Devil's Heartbeat. I had never been before, but the three of them were familiar with the area. It was a canyon about 200 feet deep, and we stayed on one end of the canyon, by the drop-offs and to our left was a ravine. And about 50 feet over, the opposite side of the canyon rose up above us. On the opposite end, there were some Anasazi ruins. The Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anasazi's origins and departure, as according to the Navajo, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, and food, and went into another dimension, or some equivalent. But whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander into Anasazi ruins. I never asked why, but figured it had something to do with disrespect or preserving history. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with my naked eye. And I got this strange fixation going over me. I'm not Navajo, and felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set off down the cliffs with a rope, and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was like an obsession. I can't explain the feeling, it was like magnetism. I wanted to be in those ruins, and it wasn't just some touristy curiosity. I felt as if I were meant to go there. I kept slipping and getting stuck on the rocks. I was so frustrated I started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there so I couldn't see what was making the growl, but Mountain Lion immediately rose to mind, and I got my ass back up the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shut the guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was that while Sarah was aiming, things got eerily quiet. We all heard sounds from around us, behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was like a growl, then a hoarse laugh, almost like a lion and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area, and there was nothing, certainly not on the clifftops where we heard it anyway. The creepiest part was, that while David, Sarah and I all heard it from a close distance, Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out to see if anything would happen, and this is when things got completely terrifying. Before, I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns though, and were sleeping with no bags nor tents. Just some blankets under the stars with a little fire. So I felt safe when we had all laid down, and I fell asleep pretty quickly. I woke up a few hours later, to see everyone else laying down with their eyes wide open, listening. The canyon was completely full of noises. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set, maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 feet away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smacking noises there were, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened for perhaps 10 minutes, no other animal noises, no nothing. 
Finally, David, who was a hard ass and the least superstitious of his family, shouted, Shut up! And everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at each other wide-eyed. It was dead quiet. And then we heard another super weird set of noises from the Anasazi ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either. But it almost sounded like a zebra. And then the rock slash stick slash whatever started up again. But this was worse. Because now other animal noises came in. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching, owls hooting, and those terrible zebra noises. We said nope. We got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse the fire, pack our blankets and speed away, with the noises continuing the entire time. That night, I was obviously pretty shaken. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me, and said that she could tell I had a rough day. We hadn't mentioned the creepy shit to avoid a lecture about messing around with the spirits. She asked me about it, and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal. I felt like I wanted to go there. Why couldn't I go? It would have been beautiful. After I word vomited all over her, I could see that she had a really concerned look over her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused, and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to lure people. When they get up to the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public accessible kiva, kind of like a tourist trap for little podunk places. But since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down via the kiva, and I went alone, as of course my superstitious family refused to enter other natives' dwellings. I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I were in a kiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward a few weeks later, I worked at a shitty call centre in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone, and I was feeling jumpier than ever since the Kiva. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but I of course did not believe it. I don't smoke, but I follow my co-workers out for smoke breaks, because I like the chat. Tonight I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out of the glass door, and being a total weirdo, it hit me then how paranoid I had been. That's what skinwalkers do. They mess around with your mind. Whilst I was pacing in front of the glass door, I decided that this whole thing was stupid, and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. Most of the smokers were already filing back in, but I walked out, put my hands in my pockets and looked at the sky. I looked at the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something I will never be able to have a rational explanation for. We have six parking lots. In one of the lots far away from me, perhaps a hundred feet away, I could see something walking. It was like a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping, and walked, like it were tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot about skinwalkers, and I started walking towards it, making the ch ch, -ch come here doggy, noises, and then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound, and it was grey, but there was something really wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped, but it walked more like a person would on their feet and hands. Its butt was moving to and fro, and didn't make any sense. When it heard me, it just stopped without turning, something I've never known any dog to do. And finally, it looked over its shoulder at me, 
and this is the freakiest part. The dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were barred as if it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl, noises no regular animals make. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me, or that it was taunting me. Somehow in the middle of all of this, I realised it didn't have a tail, and I'd heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Screw all logic and rationality, I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was inside the building and had pulled the door shut behind me. And when I looked back, of course, it was gone. When I described this to my brothers, they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker. I then went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, them, and their apartments. I never saw the creepy bloody dog again, and have ever since never slightly wanted to visit those cliff ruins. This story belongs to a friend of mine. He told me this once, and I simply have to share it. My friend is of Wooey Queenex heritage, a Native American tribe who settled in the Pacific Northwest coast. He is quite a character. For one, he is a whopping six foot ten, and has the blackest eyes that you could imagine. He always has this frowning face going on, which makes him even more intimidating. He is everything but a bad guy. In fact, he is the most gentle of giants. He was working at a gas station up in North back in 1992. He has pretty much always worked the graveyard shift, from 11pm to 7am. Business wasn't exactly booming at nights, so he was usually watching TV or reading magazines between customers. And there were a few. This area he lived in, and worked in, was deeply associated with all things Native American. There was a potent sense of pride in the surrounding communities, but also a very distinct presence of superstition and old traditions. My friend was no exception. He was a firm believer in all things of the old. This made his encounter even more terrifying. One night, he was sitting as usual watching TV, when a customer entered the gas station. The customer paid for his gas and a pack of smokes, and some soda, and returned to his car. Nothing unusual. But as my friend looked out the window towards the customer's car, he spotted what looked like a huge dog sitting by the edge of the woods. Now the window is located out on the side of the building, some distance from the sliding door, and overlooks the pumps and the roof covering it. On the sides of the roof, there are pretty strong halogen lights, which shine in to the gas station. This gives the gas station not only eerie lighting, with the blinds casting long, stripped shadows, but also blinds the teller to an extent. As he peered through the window, trying to focus on the dog, it was gone. He didn't think much of it. Even if it were a wolf, he was inside and wolves don't tend to rob gas stations at night. Wolves were common here, but this wolf was huge. He brushed it off and returned to his mindless show on TV. A couple of hours go by, and not a single customer had entered since the last. He was about to refill some condiments, when he heard a large thud coming from the back. It wasn't inside, but he could hear it. It came from the back, and behind the building they kept the garbage. The gas station has been visited before by scavenging homeless, but my friend didn't really care. It wasn't his garbage, and it was just garbage. Let them take it. But it kept getting noisier. 
he decided to grab a flashlight and a gun from the office and circle around the back to tell whoever was venturing there to leave. He had had enough. His presence alone would have scared off anyone, but he wanted to feel safe just in case. He exited through the sliding doors, walked past the window he was sitting by, and as he turned the corner, he shines his light towards the dumpster. As the cone of light hits the dumpster, my friend instantly drops the flashlight and the gun. It's the huge dog he saw before, scouring through the garbage. It wasn't a dog though, it clearly stood on its hind legs, reaching the same height as himself. It could not be a bear, it was too gaunt. The creature's eyes had been glowing in the light of the flashlight, making it even more terrifying. He ran inside the gas station, and he wasn't followed. He locked the door and stayed in the whole night, and quit the very next day. My friend is still convinced that he saw a skimwalker, a shape-shifting shaman of sorts that are common occurrences in Native American lore and culture. I don't think he ever plans on working nights again. In my late teenage years, I came into some money after my father committed suicide, and I received an inheritance from him. At the time of my father's passing, he and my mother owned a cabin up in Oregon by Mount Bachelor. The cabin had been put up for sale since my mother could no longer afford the payments, and renting it out, and renting it out would not cover the payments either. The cabin was set to go on the market for sale in less than a month, and I was in the process of finalising all the paperwork with a realtor and the lawyer. So for that month's time, the cabin was not going to be rented out any longer and was going to be vacant. I saw this as a chance to get away for a while and clear my head in light of all the things that had been going on. I quit my job, packed up my snowboard gear, grabbed my dog and headed up in my dad's car which he had willed to me. Now this was our family cabin, that my parents rented out throughout the year when we were not using it. I had keys, as well as all the codes for the alarms, so I did not feel the need to inform the rental management company and advise them of my stay. My first two days at the cabin were normal, and nothing out of the unusual happened. I spent my days playing with my dog in the snow, snowboarding, and in the evenings playing PlayStation or listening to music, as well as drinking and smoking out on the balcony. I had already stocked up on food, cigarettes, and liquor, so I was pretty much shut in aside from the occasional out to hit the slopes, with my dog as company and DVD slash PlayStation for entertainment. I was quite content and started to feel relaxed after all the drama that had preceded my outing. The cabin itself was two stories. Bottom story had the living room and the side guest bedroom, along with a small kitchen. The upstairs had another two rooms, along with a walkout balcony attached to the master bedroom. Most of my time was spent either in the living room, kitchen or master bedroom. I never ventured into any of the other rooms, and always kept the doors leading into them shut. Anyway, the third day came around, and I was going through my usual routine of playing with my dog, his name is Midnight by the way, playing video games, and watching DVDs. That day, it was pretty heavy snowfall, so I did not feel like trekking down the hill to the main road in order to use my car and decided to stay indoors. That's when things began getting a bit weird. In our area, there were only two other cabins adjacent to ours, maybe a block away from each other. All other cabins aside from these two were around a mile away from ours. Surrounding us was mostly forest and very tall pine trees. 
Both of these cabins had been empty for the past couple of days, and I knew that no one was currently occupying them. Around midday, whilst outside with my dog, I noticed what looked like footprints in the snow around the area surrounding our cabin. It was still snowing, so the footprints looked semi-fresh, as if someone had been there in the last half hour or so. I thought that maybe it was someone who was staying in a cabin near me, and that perhaps I hadn't noticed. Maybe they were shut-ins like me. Alright, whatever. The prints lead away from my cabin, and they disappeared into the snow towards the denser part of the trees. I disregarded the footprints, and went back inside. Night time came around, and I decided to head to bed. My dog Midnight was laying on the bed with me, when I noticed his ears perk up into a listening position. This was followed by him jumping quickly off the bed, and running downstairs into the living room. I lay in bed, and stayed silent. I could hear him moving around downstairs back and forth, and after around five minutes, he ran back upstairs to me, and started to do his doggy dance, as a sign that he had to pee or wanted to go outside. Shit. Well, fine. I can't say no to him, so we both went downstairs to go outside to the driveway, for him to do his thing. Only, he didn't want to pee. As soon as we were outside, he started to pull on his leash trying to drag me to where he wanted to go. He kept looking into the denser part of the trees, where the prince had been earlier. But he also kept sniffing out on the side of the house, and looking up towards the roof. After he figured out that I was not going to go where he wanted me to, he sat himself down, and just stared into the darkness. This was a bit unusual for him, but perhaps there were animals out in the forest, and he fancied chasing them. I, however, was not in the mood for chasing any animals, so I pulled him back inside, and we both headed back upstairs. Around half an hour later, I was laying in bed, when I heard what sounded like hooves walking on my roof. It was only a series of around six steps, and I rationalised that it could be a pine cone falling from a tree, onto the roof, or maybe a kind of hearted forest animal running around. But here's the thing, the steps seemed to be spaced apart, like a man's length stride so it was really freaking me out. Midnight was also hearing the noise, and was quick to run to the balcony screen door, with the expectation of me letting him out. Alright, you know what? I'm a tough guy, and at the time considered myself to be fairly well built, and strong enough to handle myself. So I grabbed my coat and shoes, along with my cigarettes and flashlight, and went out to the balcony. As soon as I went outside, I lit up a cigarette, and started canvassing on the roof with my light. Nothing there, and the snow on top was undisturbed. Weird. Could it have all been in my head? What about midnight hearing the noise? Could he be feeding off my paranoia? I started to calm down and relax again. And that's when my eyes started to adjust to the darkness. I kept smoking, and just stared at the stairs and trees next to our cabin. And that's when I saw it. In a tree, that was a little taller than our cabin, that was around 20 feet from the balcony, I saw what looked like a man, crouched in a squatting position, in between two branches. It was squatted on a branch, and its arms were extended above its head, holding onto a branch above it. What the hell is that? I wasn't sure if I was really seeing this thing, and just stood there staring at it motionless. I noticed Midnight stand up and stare, pacing behind me, and lightly barking at the same time. 
The thing did not move. I put my cigarette out and was debating on shining the light in the thing's direction. But something in my head kept screaming not to. So I walked backwards to the inside of the room and pulled Midnight out with me. Once I was indoors, I locked the door and shined the light in the thing's direction. But there was nothing there. I shut the curtains to the screen door and retreated to bed. But later on in the night, I heard tapping at the screen door. Like someone was tapping the glass with their fingers. It was consistent and did not stop for nearly an hour. Midnight seemed to stare at the door, but he wouldn't go near it anymore. The weirdest part was I had a feeling as if someone was trying to invite me to open the door. But at the same time, I kept hearing my dad's voice in my head telling me to stay in bed and to not move. I listened to my dad's voice and just stayed there where I was. I eventually passed out and woke up in the morning and everything was normal. The rest of the week I spent there was non-eventful and nothing else out of the ordinary happened. I totally admit that it could have all been in my head. A lot of stuff had been going on and I was pretty messed up from all the drama. But still, how did Shadow know the thing was there if it was in my head? I've heard a lot about coyotes and skinwalkers and had a weird experience or two with coyotes. The creepiest being that they went up to my sleeping bag and were sniffing around us without us hearing them during the night. But never anything paranormal, so to speak. My friend Patrick's story, however, kept me going back to a favourite backcountry secret stash. He was leaving the area one morning. He had been camping out there a couple of days and said that there was a coyote that always seemed to be close by. In his peripheral vision, but never overt, he loaded up his truck and started to drive down the washout to the fire road. At the end of the wash, he could see the coyote following him. When he pulled onto the road, it was running next to him. Now he was freaked out, so he sped up and said he was going at 35 or so, and it was running along beside him. Definitely not possible. When he looked back, the coyote was running on two legs and was wearing what Patrick said looked like buckskin pants. An instant later, it was a person wearing a coyote fur, keeping pace with the truck. He looked again and it was gone. We never went back to the grove after that. Too freaky. When I was 11 or 12, we lived in a small house made of mud and stone, a lot like our house now. It was two of my brothers and I in the house. Everyone else had gone to the James feast and left us to tend to the sheep. We were getting ready for bed when we heard the dogs going crazy outside. Thinking it was nothing more than coyotes howling in the distance, we told them to be quiet. We began to drift off into sleep and the dogs would not shut up. Somehow, I was able to go to sleep for a few hours. Then, I woke up very late in the night. It was very quiet and still in the house, save for my brother's snoring and breathing. I realized I needed to use the outhouse and woke up my brother to take me there. He teased me about being scared, which I certainly was. We went out with our flashlights to the outhouse. The dogs began with their crazed barking out in the sagebrush, going from one place to the next. My brother went first, and I waited outside for him. While waiting, I tried to follow the dogs with my flashlight. Suddenly, there was a very loud whine from one of the dogs. Then, everything went quiet again. It was really too quiet for that time of year. Not even the sheep were making noise. Suddenly, I heard a few of the dogs going completely mad by the truck. When I looked over, there was this man. He was unbelievably tall leaning one arm on the cab roof of the truck. He was looking at the dogs for a little, 
and then suddenly kicking one of them. They all scattered in different directions. The thing looked up at me and I saw its face. It had a pure white face, like a full moon, two burning red eyes, and a slight smile that was pure black. I could not move or make a sound. It began to walk toward me with long strides, until it finally towered over me. All I began to see was a dark red, like the color of blood when you cut the throat of a sheep. I kept getting deeper and deeper into its eyes. I could faintly hear my brother coming out of the outhouse. With this, the thing looked up at him. Reality came rushing back to me. I noticed that my brother was too distracted with his buckle to realize what was going on. I also noticed this thing's long hands hovering just inches from my head. Its skin was black ash, and he smelled like a bloated dead animal in summer. I was still unable to move or speak. The skinwalker began to move toward my brother. Finally noticing this figure, my brother became paralyzed as I was. Closer and closer it drew, reaching an arm out towards my brother's head. Something finally snapped in me, and I became unbearably angry. I broke from the trance and lunged at the skinwalker, raising my arms like a wild animal and barring my teeth at it. A growl came out that I never knew I could make. I became angrier at the thing that was trying to hurt us. It kept that smile at first, but the angrier I got, the more the smile faded. Finally, with everything I had, I began to make this primal roar at it. It fell backwards and ran away into the night. Looking back at me, its eyes were dim and dull, its smile now long since gone. The next morning, the family returned home from the feast. After relaying the story to my parents, they quickly hired a medicine man. A Navajo tribal police officer was driving west on what used to be officially named Highway 666. It was lightly snowing, maybe a quarter of an inch, which was a lot of snow for home, and he sees an old woman walking on the side of the road. How she got there, or where she was going was not apparent, because she was so far into the middle of nowhere. He didn't see her right away, but as he passes he noticed that she's dressed in traditional clothing, a shawl, dress, and her hair is in the traditional bun. Not too odd, many elders still choose to dress traditionally, but why was she out in such cold weather, and at this late at night? Hitchhiking, maybe. He passed her too quickly, and now had to turn around. As he made a U-turn, he notices that she's nowhere to be seen. This is a fairly flat terrain, and he's sure that he's seen an old woman walking. He pulls the squad car over and steps out with a flashlight. Confused, he manages to find the woman's footprint in the shallow snow. He stops the footprints until they suddenly turn into what looks like dog footprints leading away from the road in a hurry. He immediately jumps back into the squad car and meets up with another officer near his patrol. He's a little shaken up, but asks the other officer if he's seen anything like that. The officer tells him that he has, and he also explains that sometimes it's an old woman, sometimes a very beautiful young girl but always on the road, and always in the snow, waiting for the right good Samaritan to let her in their car. I still get nervous driving up these wide open spaces at night. I keep my eyes strictly on the road, and turn my music up high. I rarely pick up hitchhikers, but I never pick them up at night. About 11 years ago, a Mexican guy told me a similar story. We were in a small town in Oklahoma, with a decent sized native population. This guy was the nicest dude you'd ever want to meet, and was about 35 at the time. He had a family, honest good natured guy, that I could never see making anything up without reason. It was late one night, and we were talking about an abandoned building at the campus of a small community college 
that had been used for housing. Supposedly it was haunted. A friend and I wanted to sneak in and check it out, and he advised us not to, and mentioned that he once lived in an apartment on campus, and a few strange things had happened. Stuff like hearing footsteps upstairs in a different apartment, and a fridge opening and closing. Then someone mentioned the upstairs was empty. He figured someone was squatting there, so at 1am, he heard it, and grabbed a baseball bat. There was a staircase that led up there, so no way someone could have gotten out before he started. He opened the door, nothing but an old non-working fridge on the opposite end. He didn't stay long after his doors began to open and shut by themselves, but he claimed he wasn't nearly as freaked out as the time he was in Mexico. He was driving back from the US after visiting family. His wife was in the passenger seat to sleep. He wasn't too far from the border, so he decided to keep driving a little after midnight instead of stopping somewhere for the night. It was sort of a desert type road, and he says he was going about 65 miles an hour when he noticed something in his peripheral vision. It was in the darkness out of the passenger window. Something was out there, and it was keeping up with him. Obviously, this shook him up. He hit the gas. 70 miles an hour? 75? 80? 85? It was still keeping up, and at this point it was almost too absurd that he thought he could just be his tiredness playing tricks on his eyes. Until it changed direction. Instead of moving parallel with his car, it began to angle back towards the road, in a manner to intercept the vehicle. As it got closer, more lights hit, and he said in no uncertain terms that it looked like a human. It was slightly shadowed from the darkness, but it was certainly a humanoid form. He accelerated to 90, and a few seconds later, it angled back into the darkness and was gone. As he finished the story, I could tell his eyes were on the verge of tears and fear, and his hands were trembling. And this was a tough, no bullshit dude. It physically struck him to the core just to recall it. Not surprisingly, he said he's never going back to Mexico. My boyfriend, a couple of friends and I were on a road trip from Texas to Washington. I had driven the previous eight hours, so I was sleeping in the front passenger seat whilst our friend was driving. At one point I was sure I was having a dream. My mind said it was around 3am because it was pitch black through the windscreen. When I looked over at our friend, I could see he was just staring at the road and driving. He looked a little stiff. Outside the window behind him, I thought I saw a deer's head, but instead of passing by the window, it was staying in place with it, and every once in a while I could see a flash of an arm, as if someone was swinging it whilst running. I woke up next morning, in the parking lot of a convenience store. Everyone else was gone except me and the friend that was driving. I asked him where everyone was, and he said that they were in the bathroom. We just sat there quietly, until I told him about my dream. The more I told him, the more pale he became, until he looked at me dead in the eyes with the worst look I've ever seen. He looked as if he were ready to die of fright. He told me I wasn't dreaming, that when we were all asleep, he was driving, and that he had seen something pale in the trees on the side of the road. He kept going thinking it was a different kind of tree, as he saw something similar a couple of times after, until one of them began to move. When he looked at the rearview mirror, he said it looked like someone was running after the car, but it wasn't falling back like he'd expected, and caught up with the car with ease, despite us going 75 miles per hour. According to him, the man was of average height, but from the collarbone up, it had the head of a deer. He tried driving faster, 
but it would still keep pace with the car. He tried not to look at it, but he could tell it was still there, and stayed there for a good few minutes before he got into an area well lit within the city. And at that point he didn't have the heart to check his rearview mirror to see if it was gone. It terrifies me to think what it could have been. I've heard of something similar in Native American lore, but it's not supposed to be a good omen. So I try to push the matter out of my head as much as possible. I'm not really into the paranormal, but I had an experience about 10 years ago that I've never been able to explain. It was fall of 2006. I was making the two hour drive home from university along rural country roads in northern Minnesota. The roads along this route are paved and ditches are well maintained. The land just off the right of way is forested. For anyone curious, this was on country road 58 near two inlets. Minnesota. I was in a section of roadway, with nice long winding turns, very fun driving. It was just dark enough at the time to need headlights to see. As I came around one of these winding turns, the beam of my headlights caught a humanoid figure standing in the long grass of the ditch maybe 50 feet in front of my car. As my car turned, and my lights shone upon it, the thing strode gracefully, but quickly, the 20 or 30 feet into the woods, just off the right of way. The thing was at least 7 feet tall, taller than any normal man, but standing naturally erect definitely not an animal. It was grey, with no hair and very thin, thin enough to see its joints practically. It walked so quickly and gracefully, I've never seen anything like it. Wildlife typical to that area are bears, deer, rabbits and the occasional wolf, but I can't think of anything that explains what I saw. After I saw that thing, I contemplated turning the car around and having another look, or maybe find some tracks, but I was in full freak out mode, so I just kept driving. I was pretty shaken up when I made it home. I tried looking online as best I could to see if I could match it, and the closest description I can come to would be that of a skinwalker. This happened to me six years ago, and I still haven't figured it out. I'm an adult female who loves to walk at night. My state is relatively safe in more populated areas, but there are horror stories from the northernmost parts, paranormal or just garden variety monstrous human behavior which goes unreported. Fortunately, I'm not a tiny girl, so most creepers decide I'm more trouble than I'm worth and leave me be. Due to this, I tend to be overconfident and travel on foot in the dark a lot when I can't sleep. Six or so years ago, I was visiting my then boyfriend who worked in law enforcement. He was on a midnight shift that weekend and I was up and about enjoying the serenity of being away from my beautiful yet overrun with tourists oceanside town. Lo and behold, I couldn't sleep and decided to go stargazing for a bit down by the lake. I walked down the main street in town trying to stay on more well-lit areas to avoid smashing into a moose during mating season. Those ugly mofos will fuck your day up and their eyes don't reflect in the dark, making them impossible to avoid until it's too late. I walked by a house in the center of town which I had walked by hundreds of times during the day and thought nothing of it. From the backyard, I heard this horrific screeching growl. I can't really describe it any other way. It was unlike anything I'd heard before, and while many nocturnal animals make demonic sounds, generally while being eaten alive by another critter, this just stopped me in my tracks. I saw movement at the corner of my eye and then heard that horrific screeching growl again coming from the figure in the dark. What appeared to be an average-sized man started walking very slowly and twitching 
Everything about how he or it moved was just wrong. I could only see a silhouette, no features, but it appeared as if it had been ripped apart and sewn back together crudely. The figure then started to giggle. Fucking giggling. It was horrible. I yelled out to the figure, probably more for my own comfort and to make sense of what the fuck was happening. What the hell? Are you on bath salts? And proceeded to walk on and hope that this was the end of it. As soon as I turned my heel, the figure went into a full sprint right towards me. I jumped back and fumbled through my purse for my switchblade in case I wasn't fast enough. Then just like that, it stopped running very abruptly. It was almost as if it ran head on into an invisible wall. I stopped running too. I know, curiosity will kill me someday. The figure was twitching and breathing heavily. It reminded me of a person's body language after breaking them up from a fight, just staring, shaking, and catching their breath. The figure had stopped right where the moonlight reflected on the ground and stayed in the shadows. I did the second dumbest thing of the night by pointing and laughing at it before booking it the fuck home, staying in areas where moonlight led my way only. It could have just been a junkie high as a kite, but then again, it may have been a skinwalker. I'm not in traditional skinwalker territory, but I'm also not Navajo, nor do I have any Navajo friends to educate me on these things. Regardless, it was still the creepiest incident of my life. My grandfather told me a story once, as we sat around a campfire in his backyard. In the cool night of the Arizona desert, the horizon was clear, and each star twinkled in a purple sky, with a full flat moon hanging over the mountains. His voice was raspy and gravelly, the result of a lifetime of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. The fire danced and shined across his dark, wide eyes, as he settled into his seat, ready to tell his story. Way back when I was a boy about your age, I lived outside an Apache reservation with your great grandfather. He had returned from the war and set about raising horses and cattle on an 100 acre ranch settled between a brambly mountainside with dirt good for growing thornbush and not much else. One night, my mother was sick and Pa and I took a trip downtown about 50 miles away, straight through a dry desert, over a washed out creek and some old abandoned farmsteads. Pa and I were driving an old Ford pickup truck. I remember it was dark out, inky and thick, with only the lights of our old truck lighting up the road. I remember when the engine began to splutter, and the truck slowly had to stop. God damn it, Pa said, guiding the Ford to the side of the road as it coasted to a halt. Stay here, son, and he stepped out into the darkness, shutting the door with a heavy thud. My window was down, and the cool desert air was breezy and felt good on my hot face and neck. Pa was getting water from the back to cool the engine, and that's when I smelt it. Rotten eggs. Strange, I thought, to smell sulfur in the desert. My nose also picked up carrion, like one of those dead bloated cattles that would drop from the heat and lay there until the crows pecked enough holes into the hide that the whole thing would explode. It stunk, and I gagged. My skin started to tingle too, and the back of my neck felt itchy and my face started to get hot. The wind stopped blowing. Pa? Huh? No answer. My heart started beating, and I felt such a fear in me, in my bones and in my chest. Boy, I tell you, I've never felt fear like this. Not until Vietnam. Not until I saw men dying around me. I locked the door and reached over for my pa's door and saw a shadow bound across the road through both dim beams of light, across the partially opened domed hood. There was a creature. You have to understand, there were legends. Old legends. Older than the rock cairns out in the valleys. Older than the crazy horse, than Sitting Bull. 
older than the Indian chiefs and their shamans. The Apache, the Hopé, the Cherokee, all of the old tribes and first people, they told tales and old stories about dark Indian magic. A deal made with the old spirits of blood sacrifice to gain power, old power, enough to fight each other, the Spanish, and later the white men that came for their lands and women. They called them skinwalkers, shape changers, old warriors resurrected as skinless men, all sinew and muscle, walking on deer legs with the torso of a man and the head of a coyote, but messed up, with long malformed snouts, teeth like a bowie knife, long arms and standing seven foot, even hunched over they gut the old cowboys of white riders. They'd run through bullets, sabres, part the Spanish armour as if it were potato sacks. They could also change their voice to match the person that you knew, or might know. That's what I saw. Big and fast only for a second it ran across the road, and it turned, looked right at me in the cab, right into my eyes, and I swear it grinned at me. I sank into my seat in shock and fear shaking. I knew death was near. The air was electric. I smelled ozone and brimstone. The air felt like right before when lightning comes and blows a tree into smithereens. I yelled for my pa, but no words came out, just a dry squeak. I was shaking as grandfather told his story. He was still here, so I know he lived, but the supernatural always fascinated me, and even now, I felt the force of his words. The real power of skinwalkers was the trickery, sure. They could change their voices, but also their skin. That's why the gods took their hide, so that they could take others. Not for long, the legend says, maybe an hour before the soul of the skin who they were wearing would come looking for their mortal shell before going to whatever hell awaited them. Though I think that getting skinned alive was hell enough. A minute passed in what felt like a lifetime. One second in a thousand years. My father opened the door and I jerked my head to the left, putting my fists up to fend off an attack. Son, it's me, my father said, before climbing into the cab. He grasped the steering wheel and pulled himself in, awkwardly jerking himself back into the seat. I cringed in the corner. I looked at him. I looked hard. Boy, your great-grandfather was a good man. Treated me and my ma right. He fought the Nazis and saw the worst of the men in Poland when he freed all them camps. And now I was taking his measure. Is this my father? Do I make a run or do I die? Is this him or not? Let's go get that medicine for your ma. As he pulled the truck into gear and pulled it out onto the road and our trip resumed. I guess it was him after all, my grandfather said. But how did you know? Was it because he said something about your mum? No, boy. I knew because out the window, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the beast running 50 miles an hour right next to the car, looking at me with those yellow eyes and a grinning mouth. I looked and saw it, hunched and angry running next to us. My father kept his eyes on the road, locked straight forward. He said to me, Son, don't look at it. Don't look at it. And that's how I knew. 2008, Northern Ohio. My cousin invites me to go camping on a trip to see some hidden state park or whatever. And I happily agree because, hey, Ohio has to be better than Indiana, right? So I drive out to their house and we pack up our tent and food and head out to his truck for a few hours into the boondocks. After miles of twists and turns, the road gets bumpy, and I wake up and we're off the grid, like dirt road and grass off the grid. We park the truck and head up into the hills for a couple of miles, and make base camp at the top of a hill, looking out onto a valley with thick trees on the edges across from us. Nightfall comes fast, and when we're around the fire, 
I ask them what the park is called. Upon hearing me, they break out into laughter and say that we're not in a park at all, but on native land, and that we were camping upon some sacred hill. I call bullshit, but they name a tribe which at the time sounded legit enough for me not to argue against it. It was 1am at this point, and we were just chatting around the fire and eating marshmallows, when out of nowhere, we hear a bone-chilling scream. We all grew up hunting, and have heard our fair share of animal calls and howls, and yet none of us could agree upon what we heard. If anything, I would say a screaming fox, or maybe a wolf because of how the howl was carried. It goes on a few more times, and our laughter soon becomes uneasy, as it appears to be getting closer to us. The fifth time we hear the scream, it sounded as if it was just coming from down the valley. We all look down in that direction, and I kid you not, out of the tree line, we see what looks like a gangly thin naked man who from this far away seems way too tall to be normal. This thing takes off in a sprint on two legs at us, and without any hesitation, the three of us run off the hill and back into the woods towards the car. Being night, it only made the escape more terrifying. As we reach the bottom of the hill, we hear the scream again, but this time it's from where the camp was. None of us turn back to check nor to see if the other two are near. After the fastest two miles in my life, we get to the truck and floor it off the land to the nearest McDonald's, where we sat until dawn with no words to each other. We agreed to go back in the morning to grab our things. We do, and to our surprise, nothing had been moved or taken, which seemed weird because if someone was trying to mess with us, they would have trashed the place or at least taken something. We drove back to my uncle's where we tried to joke about it and just move on. This stuff never bothered me until I saw my friend playing the game until dawn, and I became uneasy and how it looked like what we saw. That stuff is real, and I know it's out there. I'm an Eagle Scout, and my troop goes on what we call the High Adventure every year round at the start of summer. This past summer, we decided to go to Isle Royale, a little island to the east of Minnesota and north of Massachusetts. We're going to hike about 5 miles in and then come back after a few days of swimming and hiking, but someone on our ferry convinced my scout leaders to do the whole 35 mile hike around the island. Most of the guys in my group didn't want to do it. I especially didn't because I have a metal screw in my ankle, but we did it anyway. It was about 4 days of hiking, ranging from 6 to 10 miles a day. It was probably the most grueling thing that I've ever physically done, especially with the titanium in my foot. About 20 miles into our hike, we meet a guy named Bill. Now I really wish I had a photo of this guy. He was one of the most unique people I've ever met. But later that night, we talked more and more until he told us a story about something that happened to him and his group of kids while he was watching over the island. Now, the part of the island we're in at the moment was called Wendigo. Now the name alone scares the life out of me. Wendigo is supposed to be a mythical creature and it's a cannibalic spirit that takes a physical form of a tall, lanky humanoid shape. It's supposed to mimic the sounds it hears, so footsteps, voices, etc. to lure people into the woods. Supposedly, this part of the island is inhabited with that very creature. Still freaks me out. So Bill told us that one night, with his group of 10 to 12 year olds, who have never heard of this Wendigo, come to him saying one morning, Bill, were you trying to scare us last night? We heard heavy footsteps around our tent and thought you were grunting at us and saying our names. Bill was really confused. He slept through the entire night. 
He didn't go out of his tent, and his tent was a decent distance away from his kids while being relatively close as to make sure they were okay. He knew for a fact, though, that he was sound asleep that night. He says that experience terrified him alone. Especially when the exact same thing happened with a second group of kids who had never heard of the spirits of the island either. Then, he started hearing the voices of his kids outside his own tent. He told us that the Wendigo was real, and that we had to be very careful and to respect it. He told us about the origin of the creature and of the island and how it come to be known as a Wendigo. He was a firm believer that this creature was on that island with us. Even more so that it was nearby and that it would certainly have some kind of interaction with us, directly or non-directly. Now sleeping in an open cover tent that night was honestly the most scared I've ever been camping. I've camped far from society dozens and dozens of times. This is the worst, especially when you've got to pee really badly, but you're way too mortified to go into the deep dark woods alone to pee. You can't just pee next to your tent, and nobody is going to wake up to walk with you 20 feet into the woods during the dead of night. I think we're all just on high alert and strung out from hiking and stressed out, but every single twig that broke, animal that called out, Every step we heard from animals near our tent made all of us jump. At one point, one of my guys freaked me out because he heard footsteps coming from far away and get like right behind us next to our tent. I didn't know about that. I am certainly set into the hysteria of this so. I'm honestly grateful nothing happened to me personally to make me a firm believer of stuff like the Wendigo but man, it felt like a horror movie all night. The other guys in my tent swore that they heard footsteps, noises, grunting sounds, etc. But I'm skeptical. They could have all just been enjoying the fear. The worst kind of fear is a fear that settles in deep and stays there. The kind that gives you anticipation and suspense and makes your body go into full fight or flight mode at a moment's notice. It was really freaky. I don't know if I believe Bill's story, or if it's just a matter of coincidence, but I know that Bill believes Bill. I wish I could have spoken to him more about his experience, but he's a grown man, and it's the first grown man that I've ever seen kind of tear up with fear just talking about his close encounter. And the fact that nothing actually happened to him, why would you start tearing up in fear? I know the feeling. Yeah, I was a skeptic for sure but I wouldn't like to say that I could disprove anything. To be honest, I'd kind of like to see what Bill was so terrified of. Maybe someday I will. I frequently go bushwalking, all through the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, Australia, and have done so ever since I were a kid with my father. Sometimes for shorter walks I'd go alone, yeah, that might be a bit dangerous. And as a woman, I could have the added risk of being attacked or whatever. But I carry a couple of knives with me and know how to use them, so I don't really feel threatened, and always bring a satellite phone. I just love and crave that feeling of being entirely surrounded by the bush. Anyway, around five years ago, I thought it would be a good idea to do an overnight walk by myself. Shit idea. The walk was fine. Three or four groups of people came by my way on the first day. I picked a little area to stay in overnight towards dusk, cut a few ferns back, and I had a space to stick my one person tent. It was maybe 30 meters from the track, mostly out of sight behind the trees and such. The usual wildlife noises were going on as I drifted to sleep. Though there were strange noises, I can only describe it as a bounding sound. Like someone was sprinting through the bush right past me. But it went by way too fast, with too few steps to carry a person that distance. Also, if you've ever seen the bush part in Australia, you'd know that there isn't much space on the ground to walk freely if you're off the track. You have to at least wade through the ferns and bushes, 
so you can't really sprint full speed without eating shit. I felt a bit uneasy. I thought it was probably just stuff falling from a tree or whatever. Next morning I got up, had my breakfast, packed my things, and kept going along the track. I passed a couple of people going the other way. Then, I was alone again for perhaps an hour and a half, and I heard the sound of a stick being broken. The sound came from behind me and to my left, away from the track. I turned around to look, and nearly died on my feet. A fair distance into the bush, there was something standing there, and looking directly at me. I wanted to believe a person, but it wasn't. I can't judge the exact height, but it was obviously very tall. I'd say at least nine feet. Its skin was dark grey or brownish. It had a horrifically large head with these big black eyes. I couldn't see its mouth or anything. Its arms and legs were really long. I was almost crying. Tears welled up in my eyes and I was completely frozen staring at this creature. It was like my legs were locked in position. The longer the stare went on between the creature and I, the longer the feeling of absolute dread prevailed over me like nothing I'd ever felt before. The fear built up, until I could feel my heart in my throat, and then I bolted. I sprinted away, continuing on the track. I ran and ran, and was too scared to look behind me. Tears were streaming from my eyes and I was running away. I couldn't stop until I caught up with some people going in the same direction as me. They looked at me, saying, Oh my god, are you alright? I was absolutely exhausted, running so hard for so long. I told them I saw something in the bush, and asked if I could walk with them the rest of the way. It took me six months, but I did start bushwalking again. But I never go alone these days. You couldn't pay me. I've always been a bit of a skeptic, ever since I was a kid. Scary stories don't faze me, horror games never frighten me, and whenever I hear something weird at night, I instantly assume it's something normal, an animal, or just the house settling. Despite this, something very unsettling happened to me the other day, and I'm really not sure what to make of it. I think it's the first time in years I've been genuinely frightened. I live in a forested area in the US. Me and my girlfriend live in a large cabin, and although there are roads nearby, our neighbors are at least a kilometer away. We also have two cats, one of which sleeps in the bedroom with us, whilst the other often goes out at night and does whatever cats do when they're out of sight. Anyway, I like to stay up late at night and sleep late into the morning, whereas my girlfriend is an early bird. It was about one in the morning, and I was watching crappy TV in the living room whilst my girlfriend slept in the bedroom. I was beginning to grow tired when I heard something outside, near the cat flap. For clarity, our cat flap uses an electronic chip so only our cats can use it. I assumed it was just one of the cats coming into or leaving the house and I ignored it. Then I heard it again. It sounded like something thudding against the flap. It happened several times at random intervals until I lost my patience and decided to just go and open the door. Clearly, the cat was having trouble getting in. I never thought about it at the time, but this was weird because we feed our cats well, and they're very lean, rather than chubby. I passed the bedroom and peered in as I walked past, to see if my girlfriend heard the noises. She was fast asleep, but the cat that sleeps with us was staring at the window. I called her name. Nothing. She kept staring. I shrugged it off and kept heading towards the kitchen. The back doors are through there, by the way. Anyway, so I reached the back door and saw a dark shape through the translucent flap. I sighed, expecting the cat to be out there, and opened the door. It took me a moment to open the door, and I saw the cat tense up as I opened the door. The door opened fully. I froze. It wasn't my cat. Whatever it was had started moving before I opened up, and I only caught a glimpse of a distorted figure 
kind of like a tailless dog, bolting, and I mean absolutely pelting it. I freaked out and slammed the door shut. What the hell was it? I wasn't sure. My natural skepticism kicked in, and I assumed it was just my other cat, and I had merely startled it. Perhaps the darkness had made it appear larger. Nevertheless, I was creeped out and decided to go to sleep. As I slipped into bed, I realized something horrifying. The second cat was asleep on the rug. It took a while to get to sleep that night. Everything seemed normal until a few hours later. I awoke to a strange feeling of dread. Something wasn't right. My girlfriend was fast asleep. I held my breath and heard something creaking by the door. It sounded too loud to be one of the cats. It was if a person was walking about. I reached towards my bedside cabinet and flicked on the lamp. The room was illuminated and I saw something standing just outside the open door, staring at me. The same twisted figure I had spotted outside earlier. It wasn't very tall, maybe a little over five feet, but it was its face that scared me the most. I only caught a glimpse of it, but what I saw will stay with me forever. It looked like a dog, but with an elongated face and almost human-like eyes. You know that weird distorted snarl hounds pull when they're pissed off? It had that expression. I instantly started yelling profanities as I scrambled backwards trying to straighten up. The creature turned and sprinted down the hall. I heard it dash outside and go past the window behind us, just above the headboard. I managed to look out as my girlfriend started to panic as she woke up fully. We both caught a glimpse of whatever the hell this thing was as it dashed off into the woods near our home. Grabbing my trusty shotgun from beneath the bed, as well as a couple rounds from the ammunition box that sits next to it, I ran out of the room in my underwear and rounded into the kitchen. The door was open. I'd forgotten to lock it when I saw the thing originally. I haven't seen it since, and we still live in our cabin, but I bought sturdy locks for all the main doors and windows in the house and always check the exit points at night. I also go to bed a bit earlier than I used to, so I'm asleep when the freaks of the night start to wake up. I've read a bunch of forms and the only thing I can compare it to, based on what I saw, is a skinwalker. If you know anything about these things, please let me know. This is my cousin's story. He is a combat medic for the Mississippi National Guard, and he told me that he saw something out in the woods on a field training operation, in a kind of mini war game. So there were two platoons per company, and two companies per team. His camp set up northwest of Yellow Creek, and the enemies set up just south of a farm off Waynesboro Shibuta east of Waller Ridge Road. The training exercise started at midnight, and his platoon commander decides he may as well send out a recon group to scout out a good ambush position, or at the very least, figure out what the enemy company is up to. So my cousin's squad sets off north, following some dirt trails, but keeping off the side just in case they run into an enemy patrol. So by about 2.30, they're about 500 meters away from the enemy camp, slinking around a marsh, which puts them in clear sight through a power line cutout through the woods. So the marksman pulls out his binoculars to check if the way is clear, and upon glancing, just goes white and freezes. He pulls his binoculars down from his face and is stood there, visibly terrified. A couple of seconds later, the sergeant pulls him back to the tree line and asks him what the hell he's doing just standing there. The marksman just manages to stammer out. There's something down there. It's... It ain't human. It ain't... It ain't human. Everyone stood there in shock for a few seconds before some of the others decided to check for themselves. What they see was described to me as a seven to eight foot tall furry thing. As if you took a coyote and put it on a stretching rack with matted white or grey fur and what looked like dried blood 
all over its chest. Its hind legs were 11 kinds of messed up, incredibly long and slender with knees backwards. The thing was just standing out in the open, sniffing around as if it was trying to track something down. So the sergeant radios the sighting to Company HQ and gets back. He tells everyone to get the hell out of there and keep your heads down and keep off the roads. Games are off. So his squad get the hell out and the marksman who at this point has finished having his panic attack checks again, this time with his scope rather than binoculars and the squad hurries back to Company HQ. When they get back to HQ, it is a sight to behold. Mounted patrol vehicles that were not there before are storming around the camp. Spotlights scanning the tree line and comms are going crazy, with people claiming that they'd also seen stuff in the woods. Another platoon had to be called to secure the area, with double the amount of men. There were no training exercises for the rest of the month, and an official order to, and I quote, keep it quiet and not tell anyone, not even your family, had been put into order. Which needless to say, my cousin promptly ignored. To this day, he's pretty convinced that it was a skinwalker. My boyfriend, a couple of friends and I were on a road trip from Texas to Washington. I had driven the previous eight hours, so I was sleeping in the front passenger seat whilst our friend was driving. At one point I was sure I was having a dream. My mind said it was around 3am because it was pitch black through the windscreen. When I looked over at our friend, I could see he was just staring at the road and driving. He looked a little stiff. Outside the window behind him, I thought I saw a deer's head, but instead of passing by the window, it was staying in place with it, and every once in a while I could see a flash of an arm, as if someone was swinging it whilst running. I woke up next morning in the parking lot of a convenience store. Everyone else was gone except me and the friend that was driving. I asked him where everyone was, and he said that they were in the bathroom. We just sat there quietly, until I told him about my dream. The more I told him, the more pale he became, until he looked at me dead in the eyes with the worst look I've ever seen. He looked as if he were ready to die of fright. He told me I wasn't dreaming, that when we were all asleep, he was driving, and that he had seen something pale in the trees on the side of the road. He kept going, thinking it was a different kind of tree, as he saw something similar a couple of times after, until one of them began to move. When he looked at the rearview mirror, he said it looked like someone was running after the car, but it wasn't falling back like he'd expected, and caught up with the car with ease, despite us going 75 miles per hour. According to him, the man was of average height, but from the collarbone up, it had the head of a deer. He tried driving faster, but it would still keep pace with the car. He tried not to look at it, but he could tell it was still there, and stayed there for a good few minutes before he got into an area well lit within the city. And at that point he didn't have the heart to check his rearview mirror to see if it was gone. It terrifies me to think what it could have been. I've heard of something similar in Native American lore, but it's not supposed to be a good omen. So I try to push the matter out of my head as much as possible. My girlfriend and I hike a lot. We also camp, fish and kayak. So being in a new area or environment is not usually a challenge or foreboding to me or her. I live in the countryside, and so did she at the time. So we get up and decide to go to a fairly well-known park to hike for the day, but ultimately decide to venture to a new spot. It's rainy and overcast all day, so we bring our rain gear and get to it. We head into the park area and check out the map, 
and notice that no one else is around and it looks like as if the place has been empty for quite some time. No bunny prints on the ground and barely any litter or running water. We head down the trail and come to the main part of the park. There was a small canyon which we ventured down as far as possible, but then we decided to turn back as the rocks were very slick and we did not have the proper boots. I did bring a knife though as usual. It should definitely be noted that the area stank. It smelt like an animal had died in the area. I checked for any animal, but nothing was near us. I didn't understand how such a foul odour could be emanating from seemingly nowhere, as this area was quite open. I felt uneasy from the get-go to be honest, but I hadn't mentioned it because I wanted to come off as strong and confident to my girlfriend. Not only that, but I wanted to keep my confidence in order to hold my ground in case something actually were to show up. I had this sense of dread the entire way down the canyon and back up. It was when we were halfway back to the car that I noticed there were no sounds in the wood. It was raining, so there should be summer bugs calling toads trying to find partners and birds communicating, but there was nothing but dead silence. She must have noticed it too, because then she asked me to play some music which I happily did and we continued walking to the car. I felt eyes on me the entire walk there, as well as a horrible sense of dread, like something was right over my head were in front of me but I couldn't see it. I knew something bad was going to happen, every part of me was tingling. I could feel the air getting heavy, but more like the entire atmosphere got heavy. We got to the car and hustled out of there. I asked her how she felt and she replied with weird and scared. We left the forest as soon as possible and I never took her back out there. I will never go back. I recently told this story to one of my friends and my eyes started watering thinking about it. His girlfriend looked at me in horror and informed me that everything I had experienced were the telltale signs of a skinwalker. I'm not sure if I believe in them, but that situation was super creepy. Regardless of what was happening there, I'm just glad we made it back. My friends and I rented a cabin in the mountains in Puerto Rico. There was myself and another girl, Abby. Then four guys, my brother Steve, Abby's brother Dave, and our two boyfriends Danny and Carl. The cabin belonged to a family friend of Carl's. So we arrive and everything is stocked up. Fridge is full and the cupboards are as well. Result. We straight away dump our stuff into the hallway, not even bothering to check the rooms and grab a beer. It had been a long trip and we wanted to relax and unwind first. We even started the fire. After dinner, we all went outside to look at the stars for some time. I seriously couldn't get over how clear and beautiful it was outside. It looked like we were the only cabin that was occupied. Through the tall trees, we could see another cabin, but it didn't have its lights on so we assumed it must be empty. We get back inside and open more beer and start to play cards. We were all laughing and having a great time when Carl told us to be quiet and held his hand out. Whatever dude, no one likes a sore loser, Dave taunted. Carl responded that he was being serious and told us to be quiet again. What we could hear sounded like hooves on the roof. It sounded like something was taking a massive stride and walking back and forth. It must be some animal, with our cabin being the only one with heat and lights. Maybe it attracted some. 
I suggested this while shrugging and sipping at my beer. Abby shrieks. Oh my god. What if it's a bear? Can a bear get up there? And they said they will try and go outside to scare whatever it was away. Abby and I were just left warming ourselves by the fire. Not even two minutes later, they called us outside to show us that nothing was on the roof. We even stepped back a couple of feet to get a clearer view of the roof, and they were right. Nothing was there. I laughed at Abby, saying that a flying bear was the culprit, and turned to go back inside. Then he stopped by putting his hand above the door. He was staring at the trees. Everyone else was standing still, frozen, looking into the direction that Danny was. I followed his gaze. In the tree right near the clearing of the cabin, I could make out two men. They looked like they had hooves on their lower feet and were squatting holding branches. I just thought at first it was the way the trees were designed. But, it being dark, our eyes played tricks on us and made us see things that weren't really there. I focused on them again. The one closest to us moved its arm to get a better grip of the branch above its head as they continued to stare down at us. We double locked the door. I quickly turned off the only light we had. And all that remained was the warm glow of the fire reflecting onto our terrified faces. We honestly had beer, vodka, and took to eating breakfast cereal out the box as we were too scared to head to the kitchen, where there was a window that had no blinds or curtains. Thank God we didn't open it earlier that day. We heard scratching and banging on the front door most of the night. The scratching echoed from the kitchen and the hallway, then immediately we start on the front door straight after. The sound on the roof came back as well, and no one slept that night. In the morning we all got the hell out of there. We took to staying in some really shitty rundown two star hotel, but anything is better than that cabin. My dad kids around but doesn't bullshit stories. He told me a story about a creature he saw once, something I believe was a skinwalker. This was in the very early 80s and late fall, before I was born. My sister had come down from Toronto to visit with my parents. She left sometime a little after 9pm, but roughly 7-ish miles away from home, her car broke down. At least she broke down in front of a family friend's house, and they said she could use their phone. She called dad and he came down and picked her up. The friend said that she could just leave her car in the driveway until the next day. She decided to stay at her parents for the night and head out in the morning. As they're coming back home, it's now a little after 10pm. While driving through a particularly wooded spot, they hear a loud fucking inhuman scream. It was so loud it drowned out the radio, the engine, even their voices for the split second that it happened. Dad slammed on the brakes and they started freaking out. What the fuck was that noise when suddenly something appeared at the edge of the car's lights on the side of the road? It was a coyote, at least seven feet tall, and it was walking on its hind legs. It had a black and white striped tail. It walked across the road in front of the car. Then, once it disappeared across the road, they heard that scream again, only far louder than the first time, and they got the fuck out of there. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. You guys have been requesting this for a while, so I really hope you all enjoyed it. So, I'm opening the floor to your suggestions. I would like to know which topics you would like for upcoming videos, so be sure to comment down below to get your voice heard. Remember that if you want to share a story, you just need to submit it as a text post on my Reddit page or send it to me via an email. Both links can be found in the description. And if you enjoyed today's video, please remember to hit that like button and subscribe to not miss your daily dose of horror. Because as we know, if you don't hit like, YouTube think the video was uninteresting. And if you would like to do something truly amazing today to support the channel, you now can via Patreon.
and you can find the link in the description, as well as the links to my social medias, which you should definitely follow. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.